Welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you with us this morning for an up close look at some of our favorite fossil finds discovered right here in the middle of Los Angeles. Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Agnes and I work with the education team at the Libria Tar Pits. So as you can probably tell, I'm not at the museum right now. I'm at home like many of you, but we do have some amazing staff that still need to go into the museum to help take care of our excavation sites and fossils. So we're going to try and get to as many questions as we can. And Laura may answer a lot of them during her presentation. But if we don't get to answer your question today, I encourage you to write it down so you can learn more about the animal on your own. So if you'd like, go ahead and grab a piece of paper and a pencil so you can record your experience while you're watching today. You can note down any of those questions you have, maybe a few facts you learned, or draw or write a description of what the fossil looks like. And we love fan art of our fossils. So if you have a picture you'd like to share with your teacher, they are welcome to email it to the school programs team. So this is the animal we're featuring today. And maybe it's one you're familiar with. This animal was living in Los Angeles 11 to 55,000 years ago during the Pleistocene or the last ice age, and it's the dwarf pronghorn. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to switch our camera over to Laura so we can meet today's ice age animal and you'll see me again in a little bit. Hi, Laura. Hi, Agnes. Thank you for the lovely introduction. And uh, just like many of you and my friends here, I am also working from home. So welcome to my office, as it were. I've tried to decorate for you. Um, but I do apologize if we hear trash trucks in the distance because that's how life is right now. But uh, today for an early Valentine's Day, I'm going to talk about an extinct animal that I love, Capromeryx minor, which is commonly known as the dwarf pronghorn. During my talk, I'm gonna most commonly refer to it as Capromeryx, which is its genus name, mostly just to avoid confusion when I'm referring to their still living cousins, the pronghorn. And yes, this is how I dressed up uh, when we switched to going digital before uh, last year. I am that person and my coworkers are just used to it at this point. So Capromeryx is one of the only about of a Excuse me, Capromeryx is one of about a dozen known extinct species of pronghorn in North America and the world. And uh, it's the only extinct species that we have confirmed at the tar pits, however. It's currently considered rare in our collection, but it's still the most common of our two species of pronghorn. So this skeleton on my slide here is uh, the skeleton that's currently on display inside of our museum. And next to it is a artist illustration of what Capromeryx may have looked like, just to give you a sense of size. And so, yes, if it were still alive today, I would totally be that classic LA girl with a big oversized purse and a cute little head sticking out because, again, I am obsessed with these. They are the cutest thing ever, and I'm sad they're extinct, but we can still talk about them now. But what other types of species did we find? I mentioned that we had two. So my next slide is going to talk about the other one that we find. So this is uh, the second species that we find at the Tarpits and is the closest extant or still living relative of the Capromeryx. It's known as the pronghorn or Antilocapra americana is its scientific name, but that's confusing because that translates to American goat antelope, which is confusing because it's not a goat and it's not an antelope. And I understand people who came from other continents and we're just trying to describe it as best as they could in comparison with other animals that they knew. That's kind of the best that they were able to do. And that's fair. But home on the range lied to you. It's a pronghorn, not an antelope, not a goat. And they are the last of their kind in the entire world. They have no close living relatives. And they're currently only found in North America from the southern end of Canada down to the northern end of Mexico. And they are the second fastest land animal on the planet, only behind the cheetah, but they can keep it up longer than a cheetah can, which makes them cooler in my book. And just to give you a sense of how fast they're moving, when they're moving at top speed, there's about 20 feet in between every stride as they're running. So again, they're moving pretty fast. Uh, I could talk about pronghorn for hours because they are so amazing. But since that's not the time that we have in this format, I will move on from talking about pronghorn for now. And uh, however, uh, what are pronghorn? We will still go into that one. As I may have mentioned once or twice, they're not antelope. Um, there's a wide variety. This is only a sampling of antelope. There's 
around 90 different types of antelope around the world. None of them are pronghorn. Um, but again, they have a wide variety of shape, but many of those shapes are similar to the pronghorn that we find in North America today. But current genetic evidence suggests that their closest living relatives, even though they are still quite distant, are giraffes and okapis over in Africa. So again, it's one of those things where we try to have a concept of what they are, but because they're the only ones of their kind, it's harder for us to sometimes understand uh, where they fit in the family tree of everything. But looking at these also reminds us that even though they have very similar types of body shape, this type of body shape still does well everywhere from dense rainforests to grassy savannas to mountains to deserts. So that means that even though Caprimerix is closely related to the modern pronghorn that's still alive today, that doesn't mean that they necessarily are filling the same role here at the La Brea Tar Pits. They might have been filling what are known as different ecological niches, utilizing the landscapes in different ways. But back to the fossils. I know that's what you're really here for. So this one with my finger for scale, so you can see how tiny it is, is the terminal phalanx of a dwarf pronghorn of Caprimerix. And so what that means is, so they are even-toed ungulates or cloven hooved animals. So at the bottom of their hoof, they have two pieces. So this is the bony part on the inside of just half of that hoof. And this one is from a juvenile individual, so a baby out of box 14 of the Project 23 excavations. And so again, it is a little bit smaller than the adult would be, but again, you can understand why it's so amazing. I also like this one, not just because it's ridiculously cute and I'm that person, but also because it has such a very, very distinctive shape. This is one of the earliest fossils that my volunteers when we're working on site were able to look at and be like, oh, I recognize that particular shape. I know what this is. So I love it kind of as that learning tool as well, but I have more fossils as well. And so this one is my coworker Sean's hand. This is a fossil metapodial of a Caprimerix, also from a juvenile or a baby. This one's out of box nine of Project 23. And what a metapodial is, is it's from um, the foot of the animal. But on us, our metapodials are in the palms of our hands and the tops of our feet, because the way that, they walk, that we walk around is very different. Whereas on a pronghorn, if you look at the artist's illustration, Right where the word metapodials is, those knobs on the legs are where our wrists and ankles are. So again, just kind of stretch your idea of where their foot are to understand that they're running around on their tippy toes. And the reason that that metapodial, you can see a groove that runs along it, is because in their evolutionary history, it was originally two separate bones that have fused together to make one very strong, sturdy bone. And that's what we're seeing here. And this one, is from a adult individual. This one's also out of box nine, also with my coworker Sean's hand as scale. And this is an adult tooth from the cheek of a Caprimerix. And if you see the kind of more golden edge at the top of the picture, that is the edge that uh, is the eating surface. And so that's what's actually being ground down as the animal's eating. But part of the reason that one tooth is so long is that it will continue to grow and continue to push up for quite a while during the animal's lifetime. So they're able to use that one tooth to grind down that heavy vegetation, but also still use the same tooth for a lot longer than you and I could. Because you and I, we'd wear down our teeth and that's kind of it. We have our baby teeth, we have our growing teeth, we wear them down, that's it. Whereas these ones, even their grown up teeth still have a lot of room to go to help break down that vegetation. And I also have a jaw of a baby individual. It's not that we only find babies. They're just the pictures that I happen to have because I love them. And since it's my presentation, that's what we get to share. And this one is the back portion of the lower jaw of a Caprimerix. And so you can see where I've marked where three of those teeth are just starting to come up above the jaw. But if you notice how the teeth are still very crisp and clean edges, they don't look worn at all. That's probably because this individual is still young enough that it probably wasn't eating as many plants during its day-to-day -day life. It was still probably drinking more milk from its mother to get a lot of its nutrition. And again, here's this dime for scale. So you can see how small they are and understand why I get obsessed with them being so cute. So we still have many questions to continue to try to answer, such as why pronghorns are still around while well, Caprimerix went extinct around the same time as the mammoths around 10,000 years ago. And uh, it's one of those questions where 
it may likely be a combination of factors of changes in climate that made changes in vegetation, so especially if Capromeryx, as is currently suggested, is more suited to being in a more wooded environment, something that needed more shrubbery and trees rather than more open grass and prairie lands. If that environment shifted, that might be part of the reason why Capromeryx didn't do as well anymore and wasn't able to adapt because if it's a smaller animal that needs more cover to protect it from predators, unlike the pronghorn that can just run away very, very efficiently. Um, so it likes big open spaces. So one of the causes of its extinction may be changes in climate and changes in the plants that are in the landscape, changing how suitable it was for Capromeryx to be here. But we still have lots of research to do. ha 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 ha. And uh, to help with that, we need to continue to study and protect the pronghorns that are still around. And uh, tomorrow is the 90th anniversary of when President Herbert Hoover signed into law a executive order to help cre create the very first pronghorn specific wildlife refuge in the northern end of Nevada and the southern end of Oregon. And it was a combined effort to push for that between the Department of Agriculture, the Department of the Interior, the Boone and Crockett Club, the National Audubon Society, all pushing together saying, hey, we've been looking at these pronghorn populations that we never even really counted in the past, but it's estimated around 1820, there were maybe 20 to 100 million individuals across North America. But by 1920, just 100 years later, the estimations were only about 13,000. It was to the point that even some of the people working on the team were like, we may not be able to save them from extinction, but it's still worth trying. And those efforts, along with many more, we have slowly been able to rebound that population. Now, 100 years after that, in the 2020s, the population is back up to about 700,000. And while they still do suffer um, many complications that uh, a lot of people are still working on today, the populations that are most at risk are the ones down in the Sonoran Desert and in Baja, California, that are still fighting against extinction. So again, though, a diverse group of determined people are on hand to try to protect them. And some of them are the ones that I am sharing links. And some of my team are gonna share those links in the comments for you as well. Because of course, I'm not going to leave you without sharing an almost four minute video of baby pronghorns because we're friends now. I'm here for you. And then the other one is a link to an article, some work that some of my friends at the LA Zoo were associated with just this last year in 2020. So again, a hundred years later, we're still doing a lot of these efforts, but uh, we can take encouragement with the fact that we've done some good work in the past and we might be able to continue doing it into the future. And there we are, thank you so much. I know that you probably have lots of questions so I'm happy to share with those now. Hi, Laura, thank you so much. Um, can we go for brunch together with our Capra eggs in a purse each? Because I think that sounds adorable. <laughs> I would love it. I have my little stuffed animal pronghorn that one of my friends got me. So I can just take that until we figure out how to get Capra back. I love it. I love it. Which brings me to actually one of the first questions. So Aliyah is asking, is the animal friendly? So pronghorn usually are uh, the modern pronghorn that are still alive today tend to be very friendly, but for their own safety, usually humans don't interact with them um, just to try to keep wild animals wild and keep them safe um, from humans that may want to hurt them. And the only time that we really want to have lots of them in zoos and that kind of thing, and part of the efforts that they're doing is to have a backup population, just in case the population that's currently in Mexico, that when they started this project was only about 25 individuals left of the entire subspecies. So they wanted to have a backup population just in case some disease or natural disaster happened to uh, endanger those 25 individuals. They wanted to have kind of a genetic backup. Um, but in the future, again, they are hoping to build up that population in the wild in a more sustainable way, perhaps um, adjusting how fences are built, how they share the landscape with livestock, that sort of thing. But in general, um, they can become quite friendly, but we want to try to keep them uh, not used to people just for there and our own safety. That makes sense. I that does make sense. Um, and so the cat mice themselves are small. How small are the babies when they're born? Are they super tiny? Um, I like to think of them as the adults. I would need two hands to scoop up and carry. Whereas the babies, 
I would probably use like one hand on the belly and the other hand on the head. So again, I know that's not a great description, but uh, pretty small. Yeah, We're looking at skulls about, heads about this big. But again, their heads are a little oversized for their body shape, but still pretty small. Perfect. Um, and you mentioned that they're related to giraffes and okapi. That's their okay. closest living relative, but it's still rather distant. Okay. So John was wondering, do they have tongues like giraffes and okapi? Do they share any similarities like that? Nothing that I was able to find really suggested that much. Um, some of the features that are closest is the fact that their horns are kind of weird. Um, just like giraffes and okapis have ossicones that it kind of like don't fit into the classic horn and antler categories. Um, pronghorn horns also don't fit properly into those little categories. So instead of having either antlers like deer that have lots of different prongs and are made of bone and fall off annually, or horns like something like an antelope has that has a bony core with a keratin sheath, the same kind of stuff that your fingernails are made out of that grows over them, that just grows for the, their whole lives. Pronghorn, on the other hand, have a prong in their horns. That's what their name is from. And also they do uh, shed them annually because they were kind of just like, yeah, you want tidy categories? Nature doesn't work that way always. <laughs> That's for sure. And then a follow up with that, Shri was asking, what are okapis? We're all happy giraffes, right? So happies might not be some version of thing. I'll be so familiar with those animals. Absolutely. Um, they're giraffes closest to living relatives. Um, they're kind of shaped like imagine a giraffe with a very short neck. They're a little bit more large antelope, small horse size, but they tend to be much more shy individuals that live in uh, dense forest areas. So they tend to have smaller groups and hang out more in the forest. That's part of the reason why they have that almost zebra striping is to help them kind of blend in with their forested environment. But they do have crazy tongues that they can use to like clean their eyeballs and their ears. That's fun. <laughs> and then Thomas, Berus, Berlusia, Elia, and Brittany. Wow, a lot of students are asking what do pronghorns eat? What is their diet? See, that's the thing is that pronghorns kind of eat whatever they want to, to a certain thing. It depends on exactly what region they're in, what plants are available, the seasonality. They tend to prefer more tender um, bits of vegetation, but they'll eat shrubs, they'll eat cactus, they'll eat grass. They'll kind of eat whatever they want to, um, which is also one of the things that's kind of encouraging because especially in areas where they share their landscape with domestic livestock like cattle, they're not always competing with cattle for the same resources. Sometimes they can live on the same landscape very happily and they're just eating different things, but they kind of eat a wide variety. It's one of those things where they kind of tested to see what they were eating and no particular patterns really came out except for regionally and seasonally. So they were like, they eat what they want to, they eat plants, they sometimes eat things that are toxic to other animals as well. So they eat what they want. Interesting. So as you said, they fit an, eco, an ecological niche, right? You mentioned that earlier in your presentation. So are they territorial, as Isa would like to know then, or do they just kind of go where the food is? Um, they do tend to have pretty strict boundaries for their groups, depending on the area and the resources. The group might be as small as three, it might be as large as a hundred, um, but also pronghorn are one of the only main and they have the longest migration of any North American animal, uh, land animal. And so they actually um, have a corridor that they'll travel that's about 150 miles each way um, doing these migrations. So that is kind of a special exception, but in general, you'll have a lot of smaller individuals that have more distinct territories, but then depending what resources are doing, they'll change that behavior. But I just love their migration as well. But that's part of the reason why we want to adjust fences and that sort of thing. Because even though they're very good at running straight forward, they're not designed as well for jumping. So going over fences is much harder for them. They usually prefer to go under them. And that's actually where they run into a lot of problem with barb fences, which is why there's a lot of people who are working to kind of switch out the lowermost rung to be non-barbed, or sometimes when, depending what the size of the animal that's being enclosed, maybe just not have that bottom rung at all so that the pronghorn can still get under the fence and continue on their migration. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. When I think of pronghorn, I kind of think of gazelle, deer like right? Which you were mentioning earlier. And we're so used to seeing them leap and jump, but pronghorn go under fences. Interesting. They can go over, they just prefer to go under. Huh. Crafty little things. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I like them. Yeah. 
Um, and then a few students asking Kimberly, Isaiah, and Charlotte are wondering what is their lifespan? Do we even know that actually? So caprimerics, we're not sure if their lifespan, um, but it may be similar to modern pronghorn. Modern pronghorn usually live about 10 years. Um, sometimes they'll live up to 15, but usually they'll start being considered adults around two or three years old um, and then live to be about 10 years old. Um, and then do we know how many are left modern day pronghorns? Do we know what their population is? Yes. Uh, so right now, uh, the main subspecies of pronghorn that's across the Midwest of America, the population estimate at present is around 700,000. So again, not the tens of millions that it once was estimated to be, but still a more stable population that's a little more sustainable. So whew. that's great. That's, that's good news. Definitely. And then a couple of things about excavations, actually. Uh, so you showed some of the bones that we found and Ayafi is asking, why is the bone black? Um, so our fossils tend to be that beautiful like La Brea brown patina because the sediment in which we're digging is mixed with asphalt, which is the crudest form of naturally occurring oil. So what we're digging through is usually silts and sands and clay and oil and fossils all mixed together. And all of that oil tends to seep into the tiny little spaces into the bones. And so a white bone with all those little spaces filled with a very dark black material ends up having that beautiful brown color to it. And then especially when you're looking at things that haven't been cleaned in the laboratory yet, you'll still see some of the dirt on the outside edges as well, that is very richly black because it still has a lot of fresh asphalt on it. But we want to leave that asphalt inside the fossils as well, even when we clean it. So we don't want to clean it all the way to being white because that oil is what's been protecting it for tens of thousands of years and continues to protect it in our collections. And is there a location in Hancock Park at the Tar Pits? Have you found more of the caprimerics in Project 23, our current excavation site, or in Pit 91, which is kind of a different excavation site? So, so far, um, Project 23 has had so many caprimerics. I mean, again, still not as common as a lot of our you know, big carnivores and that kind of thing, but it's actually been surprisingly common in Project 23. So it's one of those things that we're trying to figure out is it just because of the specific window of Project 23 that they were more common in that area? Or, you know, maybe the previous excavations in the early 1900s weren't focusing on the smaller fossils as much, or maybe we do have them dug up, but they just haven't been cleaned yet because we have centuries worth of backlog to get through. So it's one of those that uh, we don't know if it's unusual, but at least to our anecdotal observations, it's unusual how many we have in Project 23. But again, since that's the main thing that I work on, I'm happy. <laughs> yes, which is why we are an ongoing research facility, right? You're out there excavating in normal time. You're out there excavating every day. And do you get super excited when you find something from a cafe Oh, do absolutely. Everybody in the excavation site know? Oh, and beyond, as you know, that I sometimes just call over to your office just being like, I found another one, it's so cute. Um, I actually have a very particular excited squeaky noise that I will not make over audio because it will destroy your ear balls. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, my volunteers know that for sure they found caprimerics because I will respond at a very particular level of excited. That's wonderful. I love that. I love your enthusiasm, Laura. It's wonderful. Well, I love caprimerics. So thanks for letting me talk about it. <laughs> it's great. It's great. Um, and a couple of our students are asking, why do you like them so much? And how long have you been studying them? I'll answer the first part first. Um, so I've been studying them since I really found out about them. So like I'd heard of pronghorn, you know, growing up here and there, didn't really understand them and start looking into them. And still I, until I started working at the tar pits, which was actually almost 15 years ago now. I was like, had to do math for a second. Um, yes, almost, it'll be 15 years this July. So uh, in part of that, we find so many amazing animals and I love all of the things that we find from seed pods to mouse toes, you know, to saber tooth cat, humeri, upper front legs. Uh, but for me personally, like just because I think they're really cute, I love caprimerics. It's just a thing that's been my thing for so long now that uh, I even have friends that like make me Viking shields with pronghorn as my shield animal. And I was just like, yes, this is this is what I want. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, and so we know that you love them clearly, right? And this is your love for Valentine's Day coming up that you said. Um, but 
what is your next favorite fossil? Like what when you do that squeal, when you find fossils in Project 23, what else do you squeal for in Project 23? Which other fossils or animals? There are a lot, but probably the second most common for me are our mustelids. So things like weasels and uh badgers and that sort of thing, uh, they tend to be my next favorite. So again, maybe it's the small things that are re closely related or still around today. Um, but again, like I also squeal for saber tooth cats and horses and bison and camels and everything really. I'm that person. I just get excited. But that's a good fit for my job, I guess. I was gonna say, you love your job. I do. Did you always want to be an excavator? Yes, I was that classic four-year-old who went through my like, oh my gosh, paleontology phase. And I just never really grew up out of it or maybe out of four years old. But around 12, I told my parents that I wanted to specialize and be a be animal, paleo animal behavioralist. And they were like, sure. And I had a lot of resources uh, that were made available to me, you know, during junior college and that kind of thing to really reach out and work with fossils and kind of confirm like, yes, I like fossils and of fossils. I like these types of fossils and I like, I like digging. I like being able to be the person to uncover that buried treasure. I love working on them after they've been dug up too, but I'll admit to my selfishness that I like digging them up as well. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Laura. I learned a lot today. I'm sure our students did too. I love your passion for your, for your job and for Kathy Merrick's and we will get one. Maybe I'll get a stuffed one too. And we can take, whether we can go for brunch again, we can take those in our purses. Okay. <laughs> I love this plan. Thank you so much for joining us today, Laura. This was wonderful. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so thank you to our friends and students for joining us this morning. Again, we learned so much about Captain Merrick's minor. Um, if you want to see more from our fossil preparators, please give them a follow on Instagram at La Brea Tarpets. And we'll also have all of these videos from these presentations on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. So you can catch this recording and others at youtube.com slash La Brea Tarpets. So again, thank you all for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon. Take care. <laughs>